फेसबुक लाइव चले जाब जी फेसबुक लाइव चले तुम ताले আমাদের কি আছে এখানে তোমা বা কি আছে নাকি আমাদের সাথে কোন স্যার আমি তোমা আছি স্যার তোমা তাহলে আমাদের কি ফেসবুক লাইভে দিয়ে দাও কি স্যার জাস্ট গিভ মি আ মিনিট আর সামি ওই মোস্তাফা জামান স্যার যদি জয়েন করে তাহলে উনাকে একটু ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দিও আর কি মাঝখানে এই মোস্তাফা জামান স্যার জয়েন করে উনি আমাকে এখনি বলছে লিংকটা আবার পাঠিয়ে দাও আমি লিংকটা এখনি আবার পাঠিয়ে দিছি ও আচ্ছা So we are online. So we are online. You want to start? Sami, can you hear us, Dinaj? I'm going to start. Yeah, start. Welcome you all uh, for the today's session. Uh, this is a very important topic: ASD or PFO, close or not to close. <coughs> so we have uh, our renowned you know, panelists here uh, for today's session: Professor Mustafa Jawan sir. The, Cardiologist uh, from BSMU, um, Professor Abdul Momin sir is from the Institute of Professor of Cardiology from NICVD, and uh, lastly, uh, Professor. Uh, let me check this. Rezona Rima, Dr. Rezona Rima, who is a Associate Professor of and Head of the Department of Cardiology, Bangladesh Shishu Hospital and Institute. So, first of all, I like to um, introduce our first presenter. We will talk on the ASD uh, regarding the cardiac management. Uh, Dr. Tofik uh, Shahir Hawk, he is a professor and senior consultant cardiologist from the Department of Cardiology of National Heart Foundation Hospital. So I like to uh, I like to uh, invite Professor uh, Professor Dr. Tofik Shahir Hawk. Before that, uh, I also uh, acknowledge uh, Professor Khaled Mohsin sir, the respected uh, professor of cardiology. He is here with us. So. Uh, We'd like to start the session with his permission. Yes, uh, so uh, I'm going to start. Uh, thank yes, you, Minas, yes, for a kind introduction. And uh, welcome everyone who is present. So I was thinking, I always think about this uh, when we uh, talk with a group of doctors. Uh, what were we told uh, in our medical, uh, when we were medical students in fifth year uh, regarding uh, congenital heart disease? So it was a general idea that was given. Uh, ASDs are very innocent type of uh, disease, and uh, you can close them or not close them. Uh, they will remain and uh, not harm you at all. So in this context, I would uh, like to start with a story. So this is the I had this patient uh, when she visited me. She was fifteen years old. Her story goes like that. Uh, at three or four years of age, she was diagnosed with uh, atrial septal defect, a large atrial septal defect. And uh, at that time, they, she was asked to follow up. When she started having symptom at around age 10, uh, doctors told him to uh, she needs to get it closed. But the parents came to this conclusion that if we close this ASD with a scar on her chest, we will not be able to get her married. So let's wait and see what happens. When I saw her, she was 15 years of age and uh, she had all symptoms of uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. She was, she was having cyanosis, she was having clubbing, she had respiratory distress and um, so on and so forth. So I was very sad and, and uh, I talked with her parents and talked with her and uh, gave her medication and counseled her and told her that, uh, counseled her against uh, childbearing and contraception, not directly for marriage, but indirectly. 
unfortunately, two years later, uh, she came to me and told uh, my parents got me married, married off uh, to a person who is uh, who is a migrant worker and will not be coming home in the next two years. But fortunately or, or unfortunately, I a few months later, I caught her sitting in front of a pediatrician's uh, uh, gynecologist chamber in, in, my, in, in, my, in my private practice area. Uh, and I did not tell her anything, but I came to my chamber and called that gynecologist and said, there is a patient in your chamber. This is her name. I don't know what she's going to tell you, but she has uh, severe heart conditions. And I don't think if she's pregnant, she can carry on with that. Later, the girl and her mother came to my room and uh, told me that, uh, why are you trying to ruin my daughter's life? So I said, look, if she is pregnant, then she's going to have very bad consequences. And the girl told me, uh, sir, uh, it's better to die pregnant than to disclose to the society that I won't be able to bear a child. So this is the story of our society. Ultimately, I had to, after six months of pregnancy, when the, the girl desaturated severely, I talked with our friends at BSMU Fetal Maternal Unit. She was there for, she got admitted there after two months. She was in ventilator for a long time and gave birth to a child through caesarean section. The child had severe complex congenital heart disease and died a few hours after birth. And also in the post-operative uh, post uh, period, the girl also died. And unfortunately, no one was there to take the dead bodies as well. So actually, ASDs are not that innocent. And uh, you never know uh, who, whom they are going to harm. So whether close or not to close, I think uh, this solves the question. So ASDs are different type of ASDs we know. There are sinus venosus defects. There are second numb defects, which we are most concerned about because they, they cause symptoms very late in life, uh, quite late in life. And uh, we have a tendency to think that it's not going to be very harmful. Then there's the coronary sinus type of defect and the primum atrial septal defect, which is actually a part, usually a part of other complex uh, diseases like uh, complete or uh, incomplete AV canal defect. And the uh, natural history of uh, atrial septal defect, it goes like this in the first decade of life, there are usually some cases of spontaneous closure. It is said those ASDs which are uh, second dumb ASDs which are less than five millimeter at diagnosis usually close. But from the third decade of life, uh, the patient starts having symptoms like uh, exertional fatigue, exertional dyspnea, palpitation, easy tired, tiredness, uh, so on and so forth. And for them, uh, usually periodic screening is recommended. But at the fifth or sixth decade of life, they really become symptomatic. There are arrhythmias, there is uh, right ventricular failure, there are severe valvular regurgitations, pulmonary hypertension, leading to Eisenmenger's, Eisenmenger syndrome. And life expectancy, uh, there's almost 20% mortality at this, at this stage. And uh, at this moment at our hospital, we have two patients admitted. One is a 79-year-old lady and another is a 62-year-old male. The lady, this is her sixth admission in the last 18 months maybe, and she's having severe hemoptysis every time. She's coming with low hemoglobin. Uh, we are giving her um, uh, blood and giving her respiratory support. The, the male patient is also in a similar situation. So usually I'm going to talk about our uh, experience with ASD closer. So when we select our patients, usually wait up till three years of age or the child to be 15 kgs of weight. Uh, usually this say 34 uh, millimeter uh, defects are closable percutaneously, and they should have five millimeter margin all around. A single defect is preferred and definite uh, left to right shunt, acceptable PVR, no right to left shunt and uh, not associated with any other cardiac abnormality. So we also do hemodynamic study. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, hemodynamic studies uh, and uh, uh, establishment uh, procedural strategy, we then decide on a procedural strategy, including 
pre-procedure guiding modality and equipments. Uh, we also, okay, device implantation with caution with potential complication, including ear embolism, damage to cardiac and vascular structures. Post-implantation assessment is also very important. Generally, we perform the procedure under both fluoroscopic and echocardiographic guidance. Transthoracic echo, uh, uh, spatial inpatient with good echo window for echocardiographic guidance. Transesophageal echo has long been standard modality for our cases. As a matter of fact, in the pre-COVID era, uh, almost 90% of our adult patients underwent transesophageal echocardiography. But during the uh, uh, COVID era, we became uh, we became more brave and bold. Uh, we relied more on our transthoracic skills, eco skills, and now maybe less than ten percent of our procedure pre procedure eco the transesophageal, and part part procedural transesophageal eco is less than five percent. And the uh, balloon sizing is traditionally been said for uh, many instances, but it may provide information regarding size of the defect, including its compliance, surrounding rims, and presence of additional defect. So this is a balloon sizing. We can wait for the uh, hinge to appear, or we can use trans transesophageal echo to see the stop flow diameter. Lots of, uh, so the Whenever uh, AZ closer uh, is discussed, it's uh, customary to talk about the rims. So these are the rims we look into, the aortic rim, the uh, posterior rim, the SVC rim, IVC, IVC rim, and the uh, mitral rim. So these are the uh, echocardiographic. Um, on the left panel is the transthoracic echo. It's the fourth chamber. And in the zero degree on the left side is the transesophageal echo. Give, showing the mitral and posterior rim. Uh, this is the uh, this is the this is showing the uh, retroaortic rims and the bicaval view on the left in uh, trans uh, subcostal view, and on the right this is the at around hundred degree we go for the bicaval view transesophageal echo. So when there are at least five millimeter rims all around, we take it as a safe to for device deployment but obviously nowadays we are more uh, courageous and we accept smaller rims when they are surrounding or opposite rims are uh, quite healthy or longer so the um, as i was saying hemodynamic assessment is very important uh, for our asg less than 3 wood unit is class 1 indication 3 to 5 is borderline more than 5 uh, these are uh, risky, high risk. These are risky cases, yes. and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we say when when mm. uh, to right heart catheterization, a mm. uh, mean pressure is more than twenty five, more than three wood units. And this is how the guideline is guiding us about the um, uh, closers, uh, ASD closers, transcatheter closer. So if there's a second term ASD, we go for the shunt direction. It is left to right. We do hemodynamic assessment to uh, very simply pulmonary vascular resistance is less than one third systemic vascular resistance. <laughs> pulmonary systemic pressure is less than 50% of system, systemic pressure. There is right heart enlargement and uh, shunt large enough to cause physiological sequelae. So QPQS more than 1.5 is to one. There is functional European. Either we can go for surgical closure or we can go for device closure. And if the pulmonary vascular resistance is more, uh, we should consult uh, and less pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we should consult uh, the, with the patient about the risk, whether to partially close it, or nowadays there are uh, in borderline cases in many, many centers, they, are, they have used um, devices with fenestration with some success. And if there's a right to left, left, left shunt purely, well, we go for uh, uh, conservative management and lifestyle advices. Whether to close them in elder or elderly ages, well, you can see here um, after 40 operated and non-operated patients, the survival curve uh, uh, drifts apart quite significantly. So device closure in our center, we have closed uh, ASDs in uh, as uh, aged as 76 years. That's our highest highest age. 
and uh, the old in the elderly patients the main problem is they have restrictive physiology lv uh, endoscopic pressure is usually elevated so before closing these sds we check the edp before and after the closure we give diuretic we give sublingual uh, we give iv or sublingual nitroglycerin restrict the fluid and check at the same time check the pa pressure and we keep these patients on diuretic and uh, diuretics uh, for a, a longer time what happens to patients who do not undergo hg closure have uh, worse long term outcomes they are more atrial arrhythmias more reduced functional capacity and eventually greater degree of pulmonary atrial hypertension so uh, this is the uh, ecg this is the uh, conventional ecg in a patient with atrial septal defect there is a uh, usually right computer intermediate right bundle blunt block with right axis deviation. This is the cardiomegaly with plethora. And I would like to, at this point, uh, share uh, one of our cases. So at the beginning, we go for, uh, we check the pulmonary artery pressure. Then we go to the, usually, these are our um, favorite approach to go to the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, we put a stiff wire then uh, cross a vascular sheath, uh, cross a delivery sheath into the right upper pulmonary vein. Unfortunately, I've lost some pictures. Okay, so the device uh, here has been uh, deployed and you can see uh, it's being checked through transverse echo. Uh, I lost the pictures. Okay, so this is the... Okay, so this is the uh, okay, this is the final uh, final uh, picture, and uh, in this case, you can see there has been a, a balloon assisted deployment. This is uh, this one is a supporting balloon, transducer probe, and the uh, ASD device being released with the support of the balloon. After checking the position of the ASD device, the balloon is uh, gradually deflated allowing the asd device to sit comfortably and once we have sure that it just it has caught all the rim we usually screen and uh, this is another uh, this is a uh, this case we have deployed from the uh, mitral by engaging with the mitral valve is another approach we rarely use this. This may cause severe hemodynamic compromise if we fail to take it out from the mitral valve in uh, in proper time. Uh, this is actually a 46 millimeter device in a 42 millimeter uh, ASD. So different approaches we use. Um, finally, I would like to share our experience with uh, closers. It's uh, uh, till to date from 14, 2014, we have done more than 2,000 front closers. 1,186 of them are ASDs, 700 VSDs, and 117, uh, sorry, 700 PDS and 117 VSDs. So 60% of our cases are uh, ASDs. And uh, 69, almost 67% are female. And you can see, unfortunately, most of our patients are are uh, young adults, uh, not child. I think Rima will have a different uh, experience. So uh, we actually fail to uh, get these uh, get the patients at an early age when uh, closer would have been much more helpful. And the septal occluder size, you can see as our patients are a bit, a bit elderly. So our, uh, from 22 to 30 millimeter, these are the commonly most commonly used uh, sizes we have. Uh, finally, as I started uh, with the uh, story of uh, these fertility issues, we don't discuss this with our patients. Uh, I don't know why. But it's very important to discuss the, these issues with our patients. Usually, uh, young female with congenital heart disease have uh, diffi uh, difficulty in the menstrual cycles. 
and they have also higher rates of spontaneous abortion and miscarriage. Um, though the prevalence of infertility in men with congenital heart disease is unknown. Concern with uh, erectile dysfunction is reported up to 42% of men with congenital heart disease. And it is very important to discuss with the woman about uh, pregnancy uh, and contraception. So uh, if it, each woman needs to be individualized, planned for care and uh, that uh, addresses their expectation and contingencies. Uh, during birth and uh, during pregnancy and childbirth. And also, it's very important to make it very clear to them yeah, that hormonal contraceptives, uh, especially estrogen containing contraceptives, are quite harmful for them. And uh, actually, uh, please don't have the idea that our uh, lab is full filled with sad stories. No, usually our lab, lab is filled with smiles from young adults who has... Uh, who has got their ASDs closed without a scar in their chest, with a with the with the fellows who have been uh, uh, sent back home uh, from their uh, workplace abroad because they have a, a hole in their heart and they can go back again with a device closer without a scar in their chest. And also, we have a good number of patients suffering from uh, primary infertility who, after closing the device, closing the ASDs has become pregnant. So uh, lots of happy stories there as well. Uh, so thank you for your uh, patience hearing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for your brilliant presentation. Now I'd like to... Uh, before we go there, yes. actually I have a question for Tafik. That was a great presentation. Thank you, sir. So, you know, the dilemma we always face is that you, you're seeing uh, younger patients, maybe in their 20s and 30s, small ASD, they do not have any symptom. Uh, I guess my question to you is how do you follow them and when do you make a decision that, yes, now this is the time to close Actually, the ASD? Actually, in, in our country, the thing is, uh, it is very difficult for you to bring a patient uh, to ensure that a patient is going to come back for a follow-up. So what happens, today you see a patient with a so-called small ASD, seven years down the road, she will have three pregnancies and come back to you with uh, pulmonary hypertension. So it's my, in my general practice, uh, in my uh, general practice, I never encourage them to wait. Because when uh, ASD has been diagnosed, obviously it has been diagnosed because she was, she or he is having some symptoms and uh, waiting uh, will be actually uh, with their uh, uh, considering our social st social standards, I think uh, waiting is never keeping someone for follow up is never a good idea because you know one more thing that when they go to a, another physician or consult someone else, they will be given a wrong idea, and uh, you don't know which which theory they are going to accept, mine or their. And when they come back to me with seventy, uh, when they will come back at the age of seventy nine or sixty. Recurrent hospitalization, uh, you will only have yourself to blame because you wanted to keep her on follow up. Uh, yeah, the sir, 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 I have a question, sir. Uh, sir I have a patient, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, ready to undergo cholelithiasis of surgery, laparoscopic cholelithiasis. Before that, he came for GF, GF fitness to me with the eco result in his in her hand. And it showed there is an ASD, uh, size is only 15 millimeter. She is 50 years for, for her surgery and for her future plan. So actually, uh, the question here would be how symptomatic she is. What is her pulmonary she artery was not, pressure? She was asymptomatic, sir. It was incidental finding for GF fitness. From, so if, if it is an incidental finding and her uh, gallbladder stone is more symptomatic, you can definitely go for the gallbladder surgery first and she can close the ASD later. But the, uh, but the opposition uh, will come from the anesthesiologist. Whenever they will find there is a cardiac problem, even the simplest form of ECG change, they will not allow, they will not go for uh, general anesthesia or whatever. So if, if this patient comes to me, I would definitely say if she has an evidence a episode of polylithiasis or whatever, she can have the gallbladder surgery done, we can close the ASD later if she's asymptomatic and PA pressure is good. Uh, 
So for patients, you know, if they have no symptom and if there's an incidental finding, do you just straight close them or do you wait for the RV? No, I like encourage that? them to close close it because you know you, you never know when they will come back with symptoms. So I encourage them to close. But if there's any other condition that requires uh, urgent uh, urgent uh, action, I encourage them to do that first, then come for the SD closer. So start, I, I, I have a comment. Uh, Sami, if the Come patient on. has no symptom and the pulmonary pressure is in the range, there is no hurry to close the ASG first. Go for the surgery, but we have to cautious about the paraoperative and postoperative fluid management. We should not overload the patient with uh, fluid, and we should instruct this instruction to the anesthesiologist and the surgeon. Mm -hmm. Give half fluid than normal so that the patient will never go into failure of RV failure. So this is very important. Fluid management is a very important issue in this patient. Um, I want to ask Dr. Nasser, uh, though Dr. Taufiz has presented very nicely, and in this same scenario already have discussed, especially for the, when sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate PFO and ASD, uh, when uh, though there are some special uh, uh, differentiating point but sometimes very difficult. So uh, we know that uh, pathological uh, PFO and uh, ASD, if, if the size is almost very slim, similar, then how we, we, you can treat, especially in your country, I don't know, in our country, sometimes it's very difficult without symptom. Usually patient do not come in the doctors and without symptoms, sometimes we wait, we tell the patient, please wait sometimes. If any symptom, then we, we do, uh, uh, our treatment, we, we can start treatment. But in your country, how we can uh, proceed in this uh, scenario? So you're asking about how in USA, so in USA, yeah. to differentiate, we always use a transesophageal echocardiogram. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so we that's how we differentiate between the PF and the ASD. But you, you're right. I mean, it's, uh, the scenarios in Bangladesh is different. But in USA, when there is a suspicion, we always define it by TEE. And then I, 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 actually, I'm going to give you the talk. And in, then in only selected cases, if it's a, when we know it's a PFO, we have to have meet certain criteria before fixing it. But that's a great question. So maybe actually, you know, if I go to my talk, um, you know, I'll be able to elaborate more. Like when we're yeah, doing questions. Yeah. If I if I can ask one question quickly. Sure. Yes, please. So Taufik Bhai, um, um, thank you. It's a really, really excellent presentation. Um, two quick questions. One is. When you place these devices in young kids or younger people, do you oversize the device to, to sort of keep in mind that the people will not outgrow the device size? Is that how you go? And number two question, what is the antiplatelet therapy after your device closure? What sort of antiplatelet management do you yes, do? Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. So in children, we usually do not oversize too much. Maybe it's... Uh, highest four millimeter uh, higher than the ASD. They usually do not overgrow. What happens is when there is, uh, what I find when there is contact on, from both sides of the, uh, of the heart walls, there's gradual uh, development growth of endothelium on them. Because it, uh, I have uh, in a few cases, uh, I, their uh, patient had maybe mitral prolapse and later developed severe MR and the valve had to be changed. So the surgeon went to the at, uh, through the atrial uh, septal route and the atrial device had to be taken out. I saw that it is almost impossible to take that device out from that situation because there's so much of endothelialization. Uh, I don't know. I have not seen stents being endothelialized, but uh, there is severe endothelialization and actually the device has created a contact and that allows the endothelium to grow. So they usually, if they even overgrow the device, but actually... Uh, the septum remains intact. And regarding antiplatelet therapy, uh, for our patients, we use six months eco screen only for ASD. And when there is the devices are large, when the devices are large, like more than 36 millimeter, we continue dual antiplatelet for six months and eco screen uh, lifelong. But for other smaller devices, after six months, we don't give any antipatelage. Perfect. May, may I ask yes, a question sir. to you? Okay. And your uh, preferred location of where placement is the right 
a purple pulmonary. We Some do, cases sir. of partial anomalous pulmonary drainage. This vein is sometimes absent. What will be your Sorry. preferred approach of wear placement? <laughs> surgery, number one. Surgery, sir. <laughs> and <laughs> number number two, in cases surgery, of here, I think I'm the only member from the surgical side here, and enjoying the talk as well. Yeah, and in cases of uh, I am all, always. Uh, favoring the surgeons in some uh, of my uh, opinion, actually. And in some cases, the borderline cases, the surgeons do a repair, which is called the flap repair. When there is a excessive rise in the pressure on the right side of the heart, after closure, the shunt reopens. So do you have any such of such a facility in uh, a implanted device, which yes, might... Sir. So, might allow some, so, some, some, uh, so some sir, shunting uh, later on. Things go like this. Uh, it is said that if one pulmonary vein is in uh, is anomalous, you can close it, but we never do that. We never do that. So if there is, uh, we when we do our echo, our uh, echo cardiograph, uh, those who are our colleagues who are doing excellent echo, they always show us that all the four pulmonary veins have drained into LA, only then we close. If there's any doubt, we do transesophageal echo, we do catheterization, and we make sure that none of the pulmonary veins are anomalous. Although our surgeon encourages us sometimes that if you have one pulmonary vein anomalous, you can close it. We have never done this. And regarding the pop-off thing, uh, so uh, there is trial going on with a fenestrated device. So there is a five or seven millimeter fenestration in between the device. Uh, so the, when the, the surgeons keep an opening, so it is a system like that. But that device is not yet approved and not available in our country. Sir, so in, sir, we are the, the results of this fenestration is not very good, not very encouraging. Few of our uh, patients going outside the country doing the devices, and they have all the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. So the borderline cases, uh, if we treat the fenestration, not always the patient is asymptomatic. No, all we, the symptoms may. Yes, uh, I, I agree with you, Moment. We have we don't we have not closed borderline cases as well. One or two cases we have done, their their pulmonary pressure never went down and they never became asymptomatic. So they, they are a constant, uh, they're in constant, they are constant bother bothering from for us. So we have refrained from doing these cases. So sorry to interfere, sir. So we are running short. Yes, yes, so please. The, the, session, the question uh, so can be asked at the end of the session. Sir, question can be asked at the end of the session, next session. So uh, <clears throat> before starting the next session, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Atalo, sir. He is with us. He is the Professor of Palliative Cardiology and ICBD, and also Dr. Fazal Islam, sir. He is with us in this session. So I'd like to invite uh, the next, uh, our uh, uh, presenter, uh, Nasser Khan. He is the Director of Cardiovascular Fellowship Program, Medical Director of Structural Heart. So, uh, Dr. Nasser Khan. Uh, thank you very much, Minhas. So, thank you so much. Uh, my friend Taufik actually did a wonderful presentation of ASD. Now, ASD and PAPO are a whole different ballgame. You know, although they are both, you know, um, holding the ASD uh, or holding the heart essentially. But so I'm going to talk about the indications. So, it's very easy. It's much easier to fix um, a PAPO rather than an ASD technique wise. It takes only, you know, half an hour, even less. Yes, um, but I guess the most important thing is to understand when and why it is indicated and what is the, what are the right group of patients that will benefit from a PFO closure. So I'm gonna focus my talk on that and let me see if I can, uh, if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, okay, perfect. So let's, Talk briefly about. I really would encourage, especially the junior physicians here, to you know be interactive and uh, maybe put their answers in the chat box or just raise their hand and, um, and Dr. Minhaps can coordinate that. So let's start with this uh, very simple Nasrat, question. You should go, go for uh, this uh, um, slideshow. Can you can you see my slides? Slide can be shown, but it is in the not in the slideshow mode. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Okay, is it better now? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. So the first question is what, what percentage of normal people uh, you think will have a PFO? 
10 to 15, 15 to 20, 22, 25, or 25 to 30. Can you just uh, punch in your chat box? No, sir. Just... Any answers there, Sami? I think we're seeing some answers there, right? Okay, so somebody said, uh, actually, most of them are saying A, 10, 10 to 15%. Okay. 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 D or C. So let's see. The answer is actually. 25 to 30%. If I go to the slide, so that I can remove my slide. Okay. So, um, so as a matter of fact, the answer is D, 25 to 30%. So the flat fusion is complete by the age of two in 70 to 75% of children, but uh, the remaining 25 to 30% of people like us walking around will have a PF. And that actually was by a very large Mayo Clinic study. They found that number and in other populations too. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, the PFO and uh, Dr. Professor Mustafa Zaman actually asked this question, just how do you differentiate? So when um, in, in, in a patient with stroke, when we do a transthoracic echo, we usually routinely try to do a bubble study. So if there's any concern of a PFO, then we proceed with a transesophageal echo to define it better. And uh, a transesophageal echo can also differentiate and make sure this is an ASD versus a PFO. You can see that on the transthoracic echo as well. But on a transesophageal echo, it's even better define that, and you can size it, and you can also do a bubble study. Um, if you add like Valsalva maneuver, um, uh, that also helps to bring the PFO. Uh, so, PFO. And next question: Prism of the aneurysm, aneurysm, atrial septal aneurysm, or ventricular septal defect? Let's punch in the numbers and see what you think. So majority is saying C, atrial septal aneurysm. Excellent, excellent. So that, that, is the right, that is the right answer. So atrial septal aneurysm. So um, what is atrial septal aneurysm? When you have a, like an excursion more than 10 to 15 millimeter during the cardiac cycle, it's, it's sort of moving. We call it atrial septal aneurysm. When you have a PFO with an atrial septal aneurysm, the chance of having stroke goes up. So this is uh, essentially, you know, what you can see on a an echocardiogram, uh, it's, you can see a bulge and there is a, the bulge kind of moves uh, more than, like we said, 10 to 15 uh, with the respiratory cycle. Um, so this is, uh, uh, actually, Tafik was mentioning to me that he recently saw a patient that did a PE and found that a thrombus in transit. So this is the worst possible case where you can clearly see a thrombus going from the right uh, atrium to the left atrium and it migrates to the brain. But in you know, most cases, it's not that dramatic. It can be a very small thrombus. Um, again, uh, very similar pictures of you know, a thrombus crossing PFO and causing a stroke. So how do you diagnose PFO? Again, uh, the same thing that we were discussing. So you can do a, you can start, we normally start with a transthoracic echo. If there is a bubble study that's positive, then we proceed with a transesophageal echo. You can also do transcranial dopplers to see the stunt, uh, but transesophageal echo is uh, the most sensitive, and we uh, always use cell in contrast to see if there is a bubble moving from the right side to the left side. Uh, and uh, you know, we usually encourage the patient to do self and cough because that uh, that increases the sensitivity of the test. Because you may not see the bubble crossing, but when the patient coughs or does a bell salva, you can see the bubble crossing from the right side to the left side giving a transesophageal echo. Um, and, and is the same thing uh, we talked about. So you want to see at least three bubbles in the within the first three heartbeats uh, to uh, to make sure that this is a PFO. Sometimes you can have a pulmonary shunt, and then you can say a late appearance of bubble, but that's after like seven or eight beats. Um, so let's see this question: fifty-five-year-old patient who has no uh, history of stroke. It showed a PFO with right to left shunt. So the echo is done for a different purpose, and this is an incidental finding. Now you see a PFO. So you prescribe aspirin to the patient, you prescribe clopidogrel or Plavix, you prescribe uh, anticoagulation. You do want to follow up this patient in a year with another echo because he has a PFO, or none of the above. Don't give your answer. Sir. None of the above. Let's see what the other things. Professor Moman thinks none of the above. Do you have any answer for this? Sami, do you see anything in the chat box? I'll prefer to continue on aspirin 75. 
Okay, the patient was not on aspirin. So, you know, the question is, do you start an aspirin? If the patient was on aspirin for some other reason, yes, absolutely. So, um, so no, actually, if it's just an incidental PFO, uh, there is no follow-up or treatment needed just for an incidental PFO. Um, so, the pro where, when the question is, you know, what can the PFO cause? Um, like I said, you know, 20 to 25 to 30% people will have a PFO, but having a PFO doesn't mean that it's causing a problem. But when it causes a problem, it can cause, of course, the, a cryptogenic stroke. There is some data that increase, increase, increase the chance of migraine. It can cause deep compression sickness or air embolism. It can cause platypnea or thyroxia syndrome, and we'll talk about that. In rare cases, you know, if you have an emboli going to the right to the left side, you can have a coronary uh, MI, like a, a coronary artery, uh, acute embolism, MI, MI, you can have fat embolism, or if it goes to the renal artery, you can have renal infarct. So uh, what's the decompression sickness? It happens in, uh, you know, scuba divers. I know people in our country and in the southern coast, they're also now getting into this, you know, surfing and scuba diving and things like that. It's not that common in our country, but in the Western world, people go for scuba diving, like dive deep down. And when they come up to the surface, because of the nitrogen bubble, it can form. If they come up rapidly, and that bubble can cause to the uh, pass from the right to the left side, and it can cause air embolism uh, in scuba divers. And the risk goes high. Like sometimes they fly out to other countries for mm -hmm. the scuba diving, and then get to the plane to come back to the country. So when they get to the plane within 12 to 48 hours, because the the plane is on a high level and the air pressure is even lower. So you have, in, have an increased chance of uh, having uh, um, a nitrogen embolus, uh, air embolus forming and crossing to the PFO. So uh, like we said, it can also cause platinum or to be a syndrome. The exact mechanism is not completely understood why it causes it, but in rare cases, it can cause the dyspnea, which is the platypnea, and the arterial desaturation, which is the orthodeoxia. So you will have increased shortness of breath when you're in upright position, and but you improve when you are in supine position. That can also be caused by PFO. But the main problem is the cryptogenic stroke. And that's what we really are gonna focus on today. So, um, you know, what is a cryptogenic stroke? So a stroke that occurs in the absence of an identified embolism or large vessel source. And uh, most of the, uh, uh, the strokes caused by the PFO are, I mean, they have to be cryptogenic because we do, we can find any other cause. And approximately uh, one third of all ischemic causes uh, of all systemic strokes are actually cryptogenic stroke. So this is essentially the broad classification of stroke. Um, you can have an hemorrhagic stroke or you can have an ischemic stroke. But from the ischemic stroke, you can have a large artery thrombosis from a large artery atherosclerotic process. Or you can have a lacunar stroke, which is a small penetrating artery thrombosis. And the rest is essentially the cryptogenic stroke. So I will not go into the details, uh, but um, so stroke is, is a huge problem in, in any country of the world. Uh, it's a huge burden to the society. It's, uh, you know, it's the fifth most common cause of death and uh, or one of the leading causes of preventable adult disability, not only in the US and uh, any other country. So the question then becomes, how do you know that this stroke was caused by the PFO? I mean, there is no clear proven data. That's the problem. So we essentially rule out everything else. And you can use the rope score or the Pascal score. Because as you know, you know, stroke has other risk factors too, right? So if you can rule out the other risk factors, then you can say, okay, maybe PFO is causing the stroke and maybe it's justified to close the PFNO. Otherwise you will be closing all PFOs and that will not help anybody. So you know, the rope score is, this is how we do it. Uh, so if you have no history of hypertension, you get one score. If you have no history of diabetes, you get one score. No history of stroke or TIA, you get another score. Uh, you have, um, you know, uh, a cortical imaging proven stroke that stroke gets one score, non smokers get one score. So, the higher the score, that means you have less other risk factors, and then you can think, okay, this is more likely to be caused by the PFO, and now it's justifiable to close the PFO. So, there is also Pascal score, which, uh, which uh, takes into consideration uh, the rope score plus other things like thrombus and the size of the PFO, and if I have an aneurysmal atrial septum or not, it takes into consideration of everything. So again, like, to summarize, it is the and the rope score a spot in younger patients who lack vascular risk factors and have a cortical infarct, uh, infarct when you're imaging, they have higher risk PFOs, so it's justifiable to close. On the other hand, a patient with low rope score, like an older patient with high vascular risk, who have other reasons to have a stroke, you cannot blame the PFO on that, so it's less justifiable to close that PFO. So uh, topic 
technical detail, you know, going into the detail, I'm not going to touch the technical details. Like I said, it's very similar to closing an ASD, but it's much easier than closing an ASD. Um, so, you know, so what is the data that closing a PFO really helps? So in the earlier stu studies actually did not show any benefit. So there was a lot of uh, negative um, thoughts about, you know, PFO closure. So, so those, those were the closure trials, PC and respect short-term trials did not show a clear benefit. And, but then, you know, uh, in 2016, there was a meta-analysis done out of the closure one PC and respect trial. And that meta-analysis found that PFO closure was actually superior to medical therapy for prevention of recurrent stroke. And based on that, the respect PC and meta-analysis, they actually approved for the first time in 2016 in October, uh, the PFO closure device for patients in the age group of 18 to 60, uh, when they have a cryptogenic stroke. And then in 2017, we had two landmark studies that actually showed benefit of PFO closure. One was the closure trial, the other one was the reduced trial. And the, the only, the, the, I think they were um, positive because they had stricter enroll, enrollment criteria. So I'm not gonna spend too much time, but um, the closed trial was done in 16 to 60 years of patients with PFO, and they had uh, you know, cryptogenic stroke. One patient could not have a small vessel disease or more than 30% of stenosis of artery supplying the brain. Like I said, you have to exclude large vessel disease, you have to exclude small vessel disease. Then you can say, okay, this is a cryptogenic stroke. So after a mean follow-up of five years, the patient who underwent the applicant had lower risk of recurrent stroke compared to medical therapy. The same was in the reduced trial. Uh, here, uh, again, the age was 18 to 59. And the patient uh, who had the who had cryptogenic stroke and had the PFO clock had reduced chance of recurrent so um, again, like we said, they probably had stricter criteria, enrollment criteria, so they were uh, positive. So, um, and then there were more meta-analysis in 2018, uh, and in 2021, there was another meta-analysis that all showed there is a big benefit of closing a PFO if you choose the patient drug. So again, this is a meta-analysis, and you can see, you know, um, on the left side, uh, the device closure is favored by in, in many of some of the studies. So based on this, the American Association of Neurology guidelines were changed in only 2020. You know, these are very recent things coming up. Um, so, but they, they said you have to ensure certain things. <clears throat> you have to um, you have to make sure the thorough evaluation has been performed and to rule out other organic cause of stroke. You have to do an imaging study to confirm the stroke, and you have to make sure there is no small vessel disease or lacunae infarct, and you have to do an MRA and um, MRI angiogram, make sure there's no large vessel disease. All things have to be excluded first. Uh, 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 and like you said, complete vascular imaging, MRI, or CTA of the cervical and intracranial vessels to look for dissection, vasculopathy, atherosclerosis. You have to make an, uh, get an EKG and make sure there is no atrial fibrillation. You also have to monitor them with a device like an alter monitor or sometimes a loop recorder for a month and make sure at least for a month they have no atrial fibrillation. If they have atrial fibrillation, they have, you have to anticoagulate them and then the PFO closure uh, benefit, benefit goes away. So you cannot. In a patient with documented atrial fibrillation. So, um, the American Association of Neurology said, you know, you have to do uh, assess the uh, sources by TEE and a TEE. Um, and then also, they're encouraging to perform hypercoagulable studies. And we will talk about that a little later. So, if you do hypercoagulable studies and they have a hypercoagulable disorder, you have to anticoagulate them anyways. So, there is no proven benefit of a PFO closure in this group of patients also. So we routinely do hypercoagulable studies. Um, and, and then, you know, we have a, here at the concept, we have a brain heart team. So we work very closely with the neurologist. And if the neurologist say, yes, this is an indication the patient will benefit from a PF closure, only then will we uh, close the PF. So um, let's see. Let's ask this question and see, you know, from what we just talked about. Um, please put your answer in the chat box. 64-year-old male with PFO, no history of atrial fibrillation monitor, no history of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, no large or small vessel disease. Hypercoagulable disease studies are normal. Is PFO closure indicated? Remember, all the studies were done in 18 to 60 year of patients. But I think the only difference is the patient is 64 years. So do you, what do you think? Should we uh, close the PFO or not? Yes or no? Put in your chat box, please. No, sir. Close it. No, Close sir. It. So, okay. So if you are, that's a, that's a great question. That's why I put that up. So if you follow strictly the guidelines and the more of the studies, 
then you are right. Below above 60, you should be really discouraged to close. But then there was another trial that came out and uh, defense PFO study. And based on that, so the American College of Neurology says PFO closure may be offered, such as a population for 60 to 65, with a very limited degree of traditional vascular risk factors, like we said, and no other mechanism, in, including, but, but you have to discuss it with the patient. So up to 65, they're now allowing, and uh, below 60, is strongly encouraged, but up to 65, you are allowed to, if you talk to the patient, if you think that the patient will benefit from a PFO closure. So it has to be a shared decision making. You know, you have to talk to the patient, explain to them what the benefits are, and they have to agree, and then you can do that even in you know, age 65. So um, the, now the patient, you talk to the patient, the patient said, you know, I don't want to device in my heart, I don't want the PFO plan. What do you how do you treat them? Because you know they had a stroke and they have a PFO. The question is: so this is the again the guidelines of the uh, American Association of Neurology. They said. You can do aspirin antiplatelet therapy with an aspirin or clopidogrel, or sometimes we see both, or anticoagulation with the with the warfarin or the doat. So there is no clear evidence that uh, you know anticoagulation will be more beneficial. So you can just put them on an aspirin, and sometimes well, quite often we see them both on aspirin and clopidogrel. So um, then comes the question of hypercoagulable studies are positive. What do you do? Do you close the PFOs or you do not close the PFOs? And this is a, an area, again, the shared decision-making comes because there is no clear data. You can explain to the patient that there is a chance that he may benefit, but we do not have enough documentation. If the patient agrees, we just close the PFOs. So um, based on this, the AHG, the American Heart Association and the ASA guidelines also changed in 2021. So now it's um, considered reasonable to continuously close PFO in patients who meet uh, the following criteria. So uh, they are, sorry, I went back. Essentially, okay. so let's see. So age 18 to 60, non lacunar stroke, no other identified cause, and high risk or uh, high risk features, like we said, like a large PFO or you have aneurysmal atrial septum. I'm not going into the details of this uh, guidelines. You all know about this. So if that, you do a slide show, slide show, please. please. Oh, sorry. Let me see. Okay. All right. So you do a quick recap. So they cannot have a large vessel disease, meaning like uh, more than 50% stenosis or occlusion, small occlusion, small visual occlusion. No evidence of atrial fibrillation or other high risk cardiac embolic stroke, and uh, no radiographic acute lacunar like infarction, like we said. And then you have to also rule out hypercoagulable studies. If you rule out all these things, then you can justify closing up here. So, um, Tofik again already showed it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna show it again. Um, so the complication of a PFO closure, we also need to explain that to the patient and we need to understand that uh, you can have new onset of atrial fibrillation and that can have, because if you have the, a new device and causing irritation in the heart, uh, um, about three to 4%. And the rare complication is you can have a hematoma at the puncture site, you can have device embolization, the device erosion if you're not choosing the right side, especially if it's too big, and then you can have a device thrombosis with possible and recurrent ischemic stroke. So what do we do for anticoagulation after we close the PFO? So we usually treat them with aspirin, 81 or 72 in Bangladesh, think the small dose, plus clopidogrel 75 for three months, and then we stop the clopidogrel after three months and we just leave them on the aspirin. Um, and in the closure trial, uh, in the closure trial, they use aspirin and clopidogrel for three months followed by, and this is where the data is coming from. There are no strong data is essentially what we practice here. So I guess um, I will end my talk here and open up to questions both for Topic and me. Um, but the take home message is, you know, PFO closure is now indicated up to age 65 with ketogenic stroke. But, um, and uh, when you have a patient 65 or less who had a stroke and had a PFO, you have to consider a TEE to better define the PFO. You have to consider CT or MRI to rule out small vessel disease and imaging studies to rule out large vessel disease. You have to have an event monitor at least for a month to rule out atrial fibrillation. You have to do hypercoagulable studies. And you have to work in conjunction with neurology. Then only you can justify closing a PFO. Thank you. Any questions, uh, so, sir? What about uh, migraine? Migraine with aura? Oh, there is a, there is a that's a great question. 
Um, as a matter of fact, we do not have any data. So uh, in Texas, a few years ago, actually a cardiologist was putting PFP to her device for migraine and trust me, he ended up in jail for doing that. So we do not have, uh, we do not have uh, any data that you can um, uh, close PFP to help migraine. There are some data, but there is no evidence. Some suggestions. If someone has a large, um, you know, aneurysmal uh, septum and patient has cryptonic stroke, what what medication or sort of uh, pharmacological management do you offer? So again, if uh, the patient has aneurysm and large PFO, that will be even a stronger indication to close the PFO once you rule out everything that we talked about. There, so, there is no PFO, only aneurysm. Oh, 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 I see. And the patient had a stroke and an aneurysm. Well, then, then just the standard ones, you know, aspirin or plavix or both. I, if you don't have a PFO, then you're no, not crossing. It's just aneurysmal, right? It's just aneurysmal. You're not. You're we, not. There's we no found aneurysm of the septum what, from the what, surgical what point of view. Aneurysmal yeah. septum is a. Uh, 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 is a site for double or triple ASD and PFO. So we should be very careful to assess the aneurysmal intraatrial septum. Exactly. exactly. Uh, that, that, is, that is absolutely right. I completely agree with Dr. Moman and Dr. Faisal Islam. So, and that's the, yeah. that is the question. If I have an aneurysmal septum, the chances of having a PFO is much higher. So that's the, comes the question. When you're doing a TEE, you have to do a valsalva or a cough and make sure you are actually not missing a PFO. You're absolutely right. I completely. You know, I can, I can, I can recall. You know, 15 years down the line, we operated a patient. Just recently, he had changed his second pacemaker. When we opened, we found it's something like a, as it like as the the Epstein anomaly, like anterocept anterior leaflet. It was I mean, say like aneurysm, and that went through the like acid valve up to the RVOT. So we excised and we, uh, you know, divided the both the atria with a uh, peripheral patch. Initially, we suffered from ready arrhythmia. We overcome the initial operative stage with temporary pacing where uh, picking, picking on the RV surface. And after six months, he had to go for permanent pacemaker. And recently, he changed his second, uh, you know, uh, the uh, pacemaker, and he's surviving with the anosmal septum surgery with second episode of changing the pacemaker as well. So it is always a, we found a, that was a, there was a, you see, uh, PFO, just very, something like at, at allowing my index finger only to through the, uh, the aneurysm. So aneurysm can be assessed by cardiac MRI, car, CT angiogram or whatever, uh, but that should be ruled out first. Aneurysm should be assessed by echocardiography only. Transesophageal echo should be ideal. Yes, initial, it, MRI the first... CT scan will not uh, uh, give about the small PFO, small ASD, they will miss. But it is That's the transesophageal the, the first... Exactly. First thing that should come through the echo first. Then if there if somebody like to show any, you know, the ignorance of the echo, then can go for the further workup. The day, you know, 15 years down the line, then there was no CT and Yugam. We did all on the basis of economy. Thank you, Nasir Bhai, for your excellent, excellent lecture. And Thank you. you. Uh, really? you Dr. Nasir should be thanked thank for which PFO should be closed and which PFO should not be tasked. And it, it will be very you know, clear to us. You know, Listen. I joined later. I joined later. I was hearing the Sharia's talk. I was confused whether we are going to talk about only on ASD or I think the main theme of the talk was PFO or an ASD close to the size of the PFO. That was the basic of our talk, maybe. But Sharia has presented a robust statistics. It would be much better to know that how many of his cases that he showed over the years of you know uh, a decade and the, the uh, PFO-like size of the ASD he closed with device that would be a, and also the complications rate like we have retrieved you know more than 50 uh, embolized devices and the two death case when they were reported later otherwise all the 48 cases uh, survived which were referred within 24 hours to us and I have presented and published as well
now actually uh, <laughs> fazil uh, uh, we have not closed asds which are less than 5 mm that's good uh, that's that, I, i joined you later that's why i was not very clear so uh, and also that in our 1186 devices we have done huge we have uh, embolized uh, how much three maybe it's good uh two were retrieved the other one also had an uh, led lesion actually when we were uh, attempting the led lesion the patient suddenly developed cardiac arrest with vt and the uh, embolized so that patient uh, we could not uh, help finally but other two we retrieved through surgery of my 50 cases not all the way the asd asd was only uh, you know one third of the cases otherwise most of the cases were pda device and the uh, seven cases of bs Uh, okay, uh, so we have not uh, embolized PDS, so one VSD we embolized that we retrieved from the lung again. Uh, it was an ADO two two. Among my five hundred ASD cases, two embolized, and that was surgically managed, and uh, and that is managed in NICD. So I we must be thankful to our surgeon, and it may occur any times. Any, it, uh, it is not not a credit that we are doing uh, ASD uh, device closure, but not embolized. It is. either we are telling yes. lies or we are not uh, uh, would hiding the some something so And it may be right. it may be all right but but embolization should not be uh, less than 1% should be less than 1% and and if we assess properly and the pre procedural evaluation is the most important thing and and after per procedural if we have any any queries that it catches all the ribs we should go for transesophageal like there is nothing nothing extraordinary that we are doing transesophageal echo paraparotomy because it is it may be done and it is the standard procedure when you we are not sure that the, all the ribs are catch right. uh, caught by the device so we can take help the transesophageal echo paraparotomy there is some thank you so much for everybody thank part. you so much uh, everyone i'm yes, just want to a couple of couple of quick things in the chat box one is the incidental pf on children 12 to 15 years of age what would be the treatment i don't think we are going to close those right correct like we said 20 to 25 to 30% people are walking around with the pf you know you don't do so you don't about it unless they have the strokes some days you know i can share one statistic that some days back one person who retired from bangladesh army at the age of 60 he came to me with cough and i found that the, he had a small asd i said you have passed the army life with this so you shouldn't close <laughs> he was my relative so uh, all right the is, other question was clinically significant as an asd should not be closed so clinical significant as we should be have the shunt 1.5 is to 1 so it it should be kept kept in mind so and we also and measure the qp qs ratio per so transesophageal transthoracic echo so when there is an asd but the qp qs ratio is less than 1.5 is to 1 we should not close it as the guideline as per guideline but if the patient has if this patient has a history of stroke then that is a question like uh, we have but we should close it or not moment bhai if there is a residual shunt after your first uh, yes you know first device placement this is, the, this is the only drawback of over surgery the residual shunt is more in device closer than in surgical closer but if it is uh, less than 3 mm with no hemodynamic significance we should not close it but if it is a uh, hemodynamic significant we should close it either by another device or by surgical but this device this residual shunt is a need us for infective endocarditis so we should be very cautious if there is a residual shunt we should be we should give the uh, uh, prophylaxis in infective endocarditis prophylaxis proper perfect can i ask a question to dr shahriar yes so please. this is this is about like uh, some restrictive lv physiology those patient with asd so uh, what is his cut off uh, value of lv dp after closure of the asd or balloon uh, occlusion of the asd uh, we actually after closing the asd we uh, what we want to find out is whether the lv dp is more than the more than before closing or has it how, how, what would be the uh, cut off point 
is it three millimeter? Is it ten millimeter mercury or what? Uh, it is only five millimeter. If it is more more than five millimeter, we should uh, not the, deploy the device. And because some do. studies five, also shown that five, more than three millimeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more than three millimeter mercury is. Uh, if you if if it is more than three millimeter mercury, you can uh, think of uh, ferrocellular device or. Uh, but uh, but more than uh, ten, you should not close something more like that. Ten, we don't close usually. Yeah. So for elderly patient with ASD, we always uh, measure the LBDP, and after deploying the device, we again measure the LBDP if it is within the range and the pulmonary pressure again. So uh, after all that, and precautionally before device closure, we treat the patient with diuretics for few days with high dose diuretics, then we go for the closure. I would like to ask Dr. Rezwana and Dr. Mustafa Zaman to give us some closing uh, remarks, please. Uh, uh, I'm Professor Mustafa. Thank you. Actually, the topic was so nice and beautiful and Actually, in our country, always we miss it sometimes, especially in our daily practices. And uh, so uh, when we diagnose PFO and ASD, very, very important, especially for our upcoming cardiologist and Dr. Shahriya topic has presented nicely, elaborately, and he's doing a lot of cases in Bangladesh. And uh, uh, Dr. Momen is doing good also. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nasser can also present very nicely and uh, he always present nicely and uh, both are very close to us and uh, other persons actually give a lot of uh, actually information in this regard and I hope the upcoming cardiologist will be benefited from today's uh, topic and uh, I want to actually uh, ask Dr. Nasser especially one symptom platypnea orthopnea uh, so maybe this is actually term is very good, but the uh, the mechanism mechanism is actually uh, very very uh, not always we uh, actually uh, we find out. But uh, uh, the platypnea and uh, the orthopnea in cases of the PFO and uh, ASD, but maybe causes with other some mechanism and the shunt, especially for the right to left chambers in case of PFO and sometimes and ESD from left to right chambers. So uh, by echo, it is, uh, we can diagnose. But uh, other some, uh, uh, Dr. Salz mentioned that other than echo, we can do a lot of things. But in our country, mostly we use echo. And echo is very important and to diagnose and air bubble contrast. Uh, that is actually once upon a time we used uh, this uh, tool, but I am actually, uh, I will tell our junior cardiologists, nowadays very few cardiologists are doing this ear bubble card uh, echocardiogram in our hospital also. I don't know about the other hospitals, but it is very important uh, to differentiate. And uh, in our country, we always do not use other than echo to differentiate the PFO and ASD. I don't know uh, in other countries, maybe they are doing this. So thank you all of uh, the who are presented nicely, especially for Dr. Shahriar Taufik, Dr. Nasir Khan, and uh, all the other participants. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to join us. Thank you all. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mashrafi and the team for uh, inviting me as a panelist. So as I'm a pediatric cardiologist, uh, we, we usually do uh, uh, ASD device closer before going to school. If it is, if there is a, uh, if there is clinical uh, signs of uh, pulmonary overcirculation, or there is at least there is right atrium, right ventricular dilatation. Because nowadays parents are very, uh, I mean, they themselves want to get it closed before uh, going to school, and. Um, and I always, uh, what we, I used to tell my uh, junior colleagues that please uh, take consideration of a clinical, radiological, echocardiographic parameter before closing an ASD. So our uh, low, lower age limit is eight kilo, eight to 10 kilo. And also uh, uh, more than uh, five to eight millimeter, unless it is more than five to eight millimeter, we don't close. Uh, and, but, um, uh, in ASD, even if a seven years old child 
we have seen uh, that uh, close of the ASD with, ASD with severe pulmonary hypertension. And we thought that this is only hyperkinetic pulmonary hypertension. And we haven't checked the cardiac cath and uh, uh, the ASD was closed surgically. And a few, after a few years, we found that this patient has developed severe pulmonary hypertension and already this ASD is closed. So even in seven years old child, if there is a severe pulmonary hypertension, we should uh, do the proper cardiac catheterization. And by 15 years also, we have, uh, we have seen that. And, and, and some patient like uh, small ASD, we always check the PA pressure. We, we found a patient with five years of age with a seven millimeter ASD. And we found that the PA pressure was uh, very high and we haven't closed that. That was a innocent bystander. That also we take into consideration. And uh, PFO, we, I don't have much uh, experience because uh, as we are, uh, I'm uh, taking care of uh, uh, pediatric patient, but uh, uh, whenever we do an equal and we get a PFO, then parents are, uh, parents, uh, whether we should uh, inform the parents that there is a chance of uh, 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 that uh, this, uh, uh, that uh, stroke or there is chance of stroke. I don't know whether we should inform that they should not uh, involve in scuba diving or something like that in future. That is a question. But otherwise, the two presenter uh, present uh, presents nicely, and uh, we have learned a lot from these two presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Appa. Khaled uh, Martin, sir, and Momin Bhai. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the ASDs are uh, more easily detected because they present to the pediatricians early in course of their illness uh, due to recurrent respiratory tract infection, and they are detected a bit earlier. But the PFO, I think it is more difficult to detect because they remain largely asymptomatic uh, unless there is a, a cryptogenic stroke has occurred. Uh, so I think uh, we should uh, be, uh, have a high index of suspicion in detecting the patients with PFO. And I think uh, those who are uh, doing intervention in PFO, I think it is technically also more difficult than uh, ASD closer because the no. wear crossing, I think, probably uh, can be more challenging. And the device placement also, I think, moment uh, and... Uh, uh, Nasser uh, and Taufik uh, can give us more I I idea because uh, I think the the orifice is very small, so it's a, maybe there may be image guidance or something like that may be necessary. So thanks uh, to both of you uh, for giving us uh, uh, to enlighten us with very two very uh, rewarding treatment modalities. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will be more conscious when we encounter these patients uh, in our general practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Master P and your team uh, for inviting me as a panelist in this uh, gathering. And there is a two nice talk, both presented very nicely. One thing uh, regarding ASD, I must uh, I give a bold comment that and significant ASD should be closed, whether any symptom or not. Even our cardiologist may have some uh, confusion. There is no symptom, it is closed or not. Dr. Tafik uh, Sharia has nicely demonstrated that after the 40, there is more arrhythmia, the patient will be shortness of breath and the activity limitation and atrial fibrillation and the raised pulmonary hypertension and they have low, low uh, and, and they have limited um, uh, uh, age of life. So it should be closed, whether it is symptomatic, symptom is there or not. And regarding the PFO, I have one experience. I want to know from our, uh, Dr. Nasset, how difficulty you face uh, to cross the wire. I, in my first case, and uh, the only case, I luckily, <laughs> I for, for one attempt, that goes through the same house also with me. But it is, what is your experience in your uh, PFO closer? No.
we we are very like you know we, we are very selective so if there is an obvious pf only then we will close and it's usually not difficult to close it i use just an mp catheter and just regular o3 j wire and it's usually crosses uh, i didn't i usually don't have any difficulty in crossing we, sometimes pulmonary uh, pressure in that case we sometimes cross the uh, pf without any uh, difficulties very easily but uh, I think in a significant uh, PFO, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sarah want to know that whether we face any difficulties. We usually don't uh, feel any difficulties to cross it. Uh, it crosses very easily if the PFO is significant. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think so. someone has a question, Sadia. Thank you, uh, Mashrafi. Just to add a point on uh, Dr. Mostafa Zaman's comment, um, I'm a cardiac radiologist. So in terms of modality of imaging, um, I'm, I'm in States now, but I worked in England as well. So um, echocardiogram is the best to diagnose um, PFO and ASD, as everyone said. And uh, in terms of CT, PFO is very difficult to diagnose because you need to identify the flow. Otherwise, it's so small, it is really difficult to diagnose. Sometimes we see incidentally, but MRI, cardiac MRI is used only when uh, you have got a question of uh, what is the shunt. So if there is any doubt in terms of uh, after echocardiogram, but particularly transesophagia, that we cannot quantify shunt, then um, uh, to make the decision of closure, as uh, uh, one of the cardiologists to uh, quantify shunt, we do some phase contrast flow to the aortic and pulmonary valve and we give the number. So that is the main reason to use cardiac MRI, but otherwise echocardiogram is enough to diagnose PFO or ASD. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Sadia, Thank you. I think we, we had a really wonderful and lively discussion today. And um, I really appreciate Dr. Nasser Khan and Dr. Um, Taufik uh, for, for their really uh, excellent presentation and everyone joining. Uh, for this lively discussion. Um, I think we are gonna end up here today. Thank you, our panelists for their valuable opinion and uh, have a good, great day. Thank you. Thank you. Allah very much. Allah Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.